Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, <clears throat> I hope you enjoyed your spuds, <laughs> your spud bar. Um, so let's go ahead and get started on uh, video production. So sorry, I'm figuring this system out real quick. Okay, got it. So my, my whole talk will be about um, how to show and not tell with movies and videos, I should say. Um, and as I put here, meaning is more than dialogue in videos, because oftentimes we think when you show a movie um, or a video or whatever, all that you need to do is just sit someone down and have them say something, which can be a way to portray a message, but that's a lot of telling and it can be a little boring. And I remember when I was in a freshman in high school, actually, we had a video project with my English teacher to act out one of the scenes in Romeo and Juliet, and that usually meant um, one of the, they would just stick the camera in the corner and they would just stand around and read off the lines and it was awful. <laughs> so <clears throat> the goal that I'm trying to get across here is to show you different ways that you can portray meaning in a video um, beyond just dialogue. And also talk a bit about some technical stuff and I'll show you some free video editors as well. So I've divided them up into three different uh, categories, for lack of a better term, of, of ways to convey meaning in a video, which is visual metaphor, audio, and editing. And we'll go one by one. So we'll start with visual metaphor. So as we alluded to yesterday, I'm going to be using a few Star Wars examples because I know Star Wars really well. And Star Wars is also a really good example of some of the things that we've been talking about because at least the original Star Wars was very much made as a homage to earlier movies and it uses a lot of very cinematic techniques. So um, as I'm showing just a little bit of the opening scene, um, try, if you've seen Star Wars, try to forget everything you may know about the story. And if you haven't seen it, that's fine. Um, think about how, so think about how the story and world of Star Wars is introduced through visual metaphor and, um, sorry, I have to get over here. Uh, and I'm actually going to skip the title crawl because the whole, <laughs> because I want to see how much of the story you can get without any sort of introduction. Okay, so any uh, thoughts about um, some visual metaphor going on in this short little clip? There's obviously a light and a dark side there. Right. The sides of the moons. Yeah, um, so with the moons, sorry, I'm pulling up that shot real quick. Um, explain that a little bit more, how the moons show light dark. So there's like the dark side and the light side, which is what Star Wars is all about. Right. So, I know, I, there's lots of foreshadowing there. Yeah, honestly, I never thought about that before, and I've seen this about a million times. So, cool. Any other thoughts? Yes. You've got a large ship running away from a superior ship chasing it and shooting it down. Right. So, How? you've got like, the story of the underdog that's being right. pursued by somebody greater. Right. And how can you tell that it's greater? Well, it's huge. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you have the, the tiny little ship um, running away while the big ship is chasing after it. So it shows you there's a bit of a power difference going on here. The shape, the shape is stupid. Yeah. Like one's more rigid and like very geometric, mm -hmm. like a triangle, and the other one's more rounded. So right. So like artistic standpoint, you can see one that's better and good and softer. Mm -hmm. Right. And the arrows of the ship, or the, the lines of the ship are pointing towards the tiny ship. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just seeing if there was anything else I wanted to mention about this. What about camera angle? How is the camera angle show some sort of metaphor here? Well, they're coming from the top, so we're looking up at it, so we feel inferior. Right. Exactly. Yeah, we're, we feel like we're being dominated by the big ship. So obviously if you actually like were watching the movie, like you get the title crawl, which talks about, um, let's see, I think it's right here. Um, it talks about rebel spaceships and the evil empire. So 
you can pretty much guess which of these ships is the rebel and which is the empire, just based off of the size and the um, the way that the shot is composed and the movement of the objects and the camera angle. So here I have some those four and then a few others of ways that you can use visual metaphor in um, a video. So we'll go through um, the ones, those last three, I'll show you a couple just screenshot examples. So here's a couple of examples of color, specifically, bleh, bleh, specifically from the Lord of the Rings movies. Um, so here's the start, a, a scene from early in, in the first movie, and this is a scene from um, late <clears throat> in the last movie. So what can you perhaps guess from the setting based off of the color here? Right. Well, life and this is drastically different. Yes, definitely. One is very light and happy, full of hobbits, and the other is dark and desolate, full of evil creatures that want to kill Right. How can you. What about the colors? So this is a lot of green and yellow. What yes. might that be suggestive of? Right. Whereas this is a lot of red and dark and yes. black and. Fire, Ink. death, danger. Hell. Yeah. Good. So some lighting. This is from up. To the um, so here's a light, happy scene. And then immediately after that scene, we get this. Um, so there's both, I would say there's both light and color going on here. So here it's all light and happy, of course. And then here it's... Um, dark and of course sad and even really by itself if you just show these two images that tells a story just by itself you don't even need the rest of the movie to get a story from these two images one other thing to point out about lighting then um, is how this part is really bright so it focuses your attention towards it whereas the rest of it is dark because that part of the shot is not important so that's another thing you can do with lighting is just direct your attention but generally of course bright scenes mean sort of happy and lively and dark scenes can be sad, perhaps sometimes dangerous or scary. Okay, so scenery I have from Rocky, which I must admit I've actually not seen. <laughs> but, yeah. um, but this is a very famous example of using a scenery as a metaphor in a movie um, with him going up the stairs. Um, so obviously the stairs represent him working towards and achieving a goal, um, going up the stairs. If you will remember, actually, Crystal uses, used stairs as a metaphor in her video yesterday, actually. Um, <clears throat> and hers perhaps talking about moving towards a new stage in life. So, any questions or comments about these visual metaphors, examples? Okay. Next I'm going to talk about audio which obviously we talked about yesterday with Matt. Here's another Star Wars example. <laughs> so um, someone actually took the ending scene of Star Wars and actually took the music out. Um, so first I'm going to play it with the music just so you get an idea if you've not seen the movie before. So you get the idea. Without the music, the scene is just terrible. <laughs> um, uh, if you want to go, if you Google that, you just do like uh, Star Wars Throne Room, no music, and it'll pop up. So um, as you can tell, music is a clearly a very important part of that scene, and if you don't have it, it's just awkward and just weird, and they're just sort of like standing around smiling at each other. Whereas with the music, it's much more triumphant, um, and it's of course John Williams, the great composer who won an Academy Award for this movie. So clearly, the music is very important. And also, the type of music can make a big difference, too. Um, so let me get to the right point in the video. This is a guy who made a whole video about music. I'm just going to show a couple clips. Basically took the same scene and just put different, the same scene and just put different music with it. OK, you get the idea. So then let's go to 250 with the same scene. OK, so. <laughs> 
Um, what, what can you tell me about how this scene is different? It's more silly. Yeah. <laughs> so whimsical. One, well, one, also it seems like he's breaking in, or like, you know, like doing something yeah. bad the first round. Mm -hmm. Now it's like, like he's coming out. home for, for Christmas time or something. Right. <laughs> right. This, it, what's weird is they have like the Santa Claus thing on the door, yeah. and it yeah. feels yeah. out of place in the scary music, but here it feels like right at home. Yeah. It's still kind of weird though that he's wearing like a hood to this happy music. Like it's still shot kind of he's, creepily. He's kind of shady. I don't trust him either way. Yeah. In the uh, second one, I feel like he just got home and he's super hungover and like. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So it's more like a comedy. Yeah. Yeah. I could see that. <laughs> okay. So next, I'm gonna do. This will be my last Star Wars example. Uh, <laughs> I actually don't have that many more examples, but this is um. Just this is someone did this scene for the first episode one, not the first Star Wars, of um, Darth Vader, not Darth Vader, sorry, Darth Maul, and Obi Wan and Qui Gon Jinn fighting. And I'm just gonna play the original real quick, just so you can get an idea. So yeah, sound effects obviously also make a big difference in movies. Particular, I mean, obviously this is an action scene. Um, Probably in your classrooms, you're not going to be doing a whole lot of action scenes. But, I mean, I don't know what your students are planning on doing. But um, sound effects can just be as basic as creating a setting. So you could have, like, bird chirps if you had an outdoor scene. Or um, if, I don't know, someone was knocking on the door and you just couldn't get good audio of it from actually there. You could go online and just get a sound effect of someone knocking on the door and it'll just sound much better than recording it live. So there's a lot of different ways that you can use sound effects. Um, any questions or comments about audio? Okay. So real quick, I'm going to show you where you can get some good audio from Creative Commons. Um, resources, but real quick I need to explain what Creative Commons means so that you know what resources you can and cannot use. So, first of all, any sort of um, work published before 1923 is out of copyright in the United States. So you can be free to use it wherever and whenever. Um, now that does not apply to any sort of music necessarily written before 1923 because if it's a performance of that music, if that performance belongs to whoever made the performance even if it's just like Beethoven's Ninth Symphony or what have you. Also, any sort of, anytime you create a work, it is automatically under copyright, and it belongs to the person who created it. Um, creators, however, can choose to waive copyright and place it in the public domain. And if it is in the public domain, then you can be free to use it whenever and wherever you want. Um, Creative Commons is neither public domain nor under copyright. It's a sort of middle ground where um, the creator Give, gives permission for others to use their work and share it, but you have to follow some rules that they specify. So any sort of Creative Commons license that you might see might use one, of the, one or more of these four rules. Um, so uh, with attribution, and this is pretty much on every rule, you have to, if you use their work, you need to give credit to the author and perhaps link to them if it's an online website. Usually the author or creator will say how they want you to share it. Um, Non-commercial means you can't use it to, to, for some sort of product that you intend to sell. That's not very common. I'm sorry, that is common, but um, this is probably not something you guys are going to have to deal with because you're just using it in classrooms. Share alike means you have to use uh, the same license as the original person. So if someone has a non-commercial in their license, that means your work has to also use a non-commercial license because otherwise they could use um, what is in your work. Um, otherwise they could use their work through your work for a commercial product if you did not have that license. And this last one is particularly important to look for because if it says no deri derivative works, that means they don't want you to alter it or, or make it a part of any other thing. And I double check this and if someone has a no derivatives license on their music you can't use it in your video um, now that being said you um, you can always try to contact the creator and oftentimes they will um, give you special permission but obviously that's a lot of trouble to contact someone so usually I just keep looking for other works you can also make your own creative comments 
license. And yes. It's, it's really easy at that website. So mm -hmm. I could do that right, right now. Videos. You could make those decisions for yourself, and then it gives you basically the little JPEG that you need. Whoops. But with whatever it is you created. Yeah, I'm trying to pull that over <clears throat> just to show you how easy it is to make a license. So if you go to share your work, this is creativecommons.org, and then just click get started. You can say allow adapt adaptions of your work to be shared. So yes, but we don't want commercial uses. So this results in an attribution, non-commercial 4.0 license. And then all you have to do, if it's on a website, you just copy this little code and put it on um, your website. Or if, if you have like a video, for example, on YouTube, you would put that in the video description. Um, and also, you can of course always change it to, okay, we want it to be share alike, so that adds the share alike rule. And oh, actually we do want to allow commercial works, then that takes away the commercial one. So it's very customizable, it's very easy. I've d used it a ton. So now that we know about that, I'm gonna show you Obviously, you guys have looked at all of these, but I want to show you how Creative Commons applies to it. Um, so let's see here. This one I remember looking at. So this was um, this website in particular. This music library has a lot of performances of um, classical music in particular. So this one, for example, is yes, Moonlight Sonata. So whenever you find something like this, it's always good to look for the copyright section. So here we go. Creative Commons, attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives. So that means we can't use it because it's a non-derivative. So let's see about this one. And this one is just Creative Commons attribution. So this one we can use. We just have to make sure that we give credit to the person who made it. And these, if it's not clear by this website, like the way that they organize it is that these are all different recordings of different people have done of this music. Um, so this is the first one, divided into the three movements of the piece, and same with this one. So using it as the background in a video uh, makes it a derivative? Yes. Okay. I, I triple check that, and that is, counts as a derivative. And that's Creative Commons was saying that. I gotcha. Yeah. So why do they put it on there if they say no derivative? Um, well, the idea is that you could still like share it yourself. Like, like obviously you could download it to your phone and still use it. And you kind of like this song and then share it. With people. Yeah, you could share it with you, but you couldn't actually use it. You can play it in your classroom. Though. Right, you could play it in your classroom. Yeah. Okay. So in general, just look out for the no derivatives link. And then videos. Um, I'm going to show you real quick how to do a YouTube search because in case you wanted to use like stock video someone else has made. What you can do on YouTube is actually search for um, videos that are in the Creative Commons. So I'm just going to search for a video about space, if I wanted a little space scene. And then I go to filter right here, and then here we go, Creative Commons. Good. And so then I can go to this video and then, okay, Joe once Elfie. I get past the ad, I can I actually... I need this right away. Yes, sir. How can I help you? Any sort of part of this video I'd be allowed to use in my video. Now I would need to check, show more. It's Creative Commons here. So here we go. Creative Commons attribution license. So we could use this. Um, and the rest of these are websites. Um, that also have their own videos. And generally, so I have NASA and Hubble Space Telescope, any sort of government agency that makes videos, like US government agency, those videos are automatically public domain. So you could use those however you want. All right, now we're gonna talk about editing. Sorry, sorry, I should have asked. Does that, do any of you have any questions about Creative Commons and copyright? Because it is a bit of a confusing issue. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you said the government uh, videos are public domain. Yeah. Does that mean they're non-derivative? I mean, they, they don't use Creative Commons. They're just straight up public domain. Okay, so you, uh, you can use them however you want. Yeah. yeah. And then is this slide just something else that you guys are just going to put on the Yep. 
We did not have printouts of it because it was a lot of videos. But I do have a uh, handout in the back that has this list of sites. Um, it should be in your packets. And it also has a short little guide to Creative Commons. Any other questions? It's one page. It's one page. It's in the back. Okay, so real quick, actually I forgot, there's a little bit more Star Wars, but it's the same scene. I'm just going to show you how it transitions the scene. Okay, so where is this scene now? Inside. Yeah, how can we tell? How do we know? Because he got just focused on the little ship. Right. And he's shaking because he got the little ship shot. But they're both shooting. No, the little ship got just shot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The editing carries it over from one scene to the next. So you have the ship getting hit, shake, oh, we're inside the ship because we can tell that the shaking is going on inside the ship. Plus, the shot was right above the ship right before we did the cut. So that's a... Editing allows you to do a lot of um, creative, th subtle things like that without you having to actively like tell someone, now we're inside the ship. <laughs> so um, this is an early example of how um, editing can be used to convey meaning. Um, this was actually from, um, sorry, I lost my notes here. Oh, well, I, I have it in my head. So this was in <laughs> this guy named uh, Kuleshov, he was a Soviet filmmaker, and in 1921, he did this little experiment with editing, and I'll just show you a little bit real quick. Okay, so it showed a man, it showed food. Well, I didn't want that to keep going. Sorry. I forget you saw that. So it showed the man, <laughs> and it showed food. Uh, what, what, can, what do you think is going on there? Yeah. <laughs> so that was the first experiment, and then let's... Now what's going on? The man killed the little girl Yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah, it, it and also the lack of sound is kind of yeah. creepy. Yeah. And the light. Like, yeah. Mhm. Mm and then here's the last experiment. <laughs> okay, now it's going. Oh, forget it. Yeah, forget about the soup again. <laughs> so the basic idea here is that you have the soup and the guy. That means oh, he's about to eat the soup. If you have the soup, if you have the guy and the baby, what does that mean? Well, I don't know. He's mourning. Yeah, he's mourning. He's right. right. And then you have the man and the woman. Yeah. Yeah. This is just with criminal minds. Right. <laughs> so. The basic idea that he came up with, which is called the Kuleshov effect, is that depending on what shot you, how you put shots together, it can change the meaning of both. So it changes how you view the man. Either he's a guy that just wants to eat some soup, he's a guy who's mourning the death of a child, or he killed the child, maybe. Um, and the third one is, oh, he's lusting after this woman. But it's all the same shot of, the same shot of this guy. It's just it changes depending on um, what is shown next to it. And actually, um, Hitchcock talked about this a bit, and he used an example of if an old man, if you show a shot of an old man looking at something, and then you show um, a shot of, of a mother and child, it means, oh, he's a family man. But then if you do the same shot with the man, but then cut it with a shot of um, a young woman, 
possibly not very well dressed than, oh, that old man is dirty. So it completely changes your perception of the old man depending on how the shots are put together. So the way you could perhaps use this um, with your own projects is, um, I don't necessarily have a specific example in mind, but putting two things together that can juxtapose to each other to create some sort of meaning. Do you have any questions about that? It's the coolest. K U L E S H O V. Okay, and then here's actually an example of it in a movie. This is from uh, Mrs. Doubtfire, um, which is a great movie. Um, just to give you some context, um, the couple are fighting. I'm just going to show the end of the scene. Um, it's a good Robin Williams documentary on HBO. Yeah. I have not. That sounds funny, though. <laughs> Sorry. I want to make sure I get to the right part. Okay. So after she said I want a divorce, what did it cut to? Kids. Yeah. So how does that change the meaning of the scene? Well, their perspective. Mm -hmm. It's not man and wife, it's family. Right. It doesn't, it's not just a situation that's happening with them. It's a situation that's happening with um, the whole family. And it, it shows how it affects the children as well. Um, so that's a, th this is called a reaction shot, which is basically to show something that's happening and then sh show someone else reacting to it. Um, and particularly with close-up shots, and the, gift of, the good thing about a close-up shot when the camera's really close to a person's face is that it shows their emotion. It really highlights how they're feeling. So if you follow uh, some sort of event with a reaction shot, it really humanizes um, whatever event you're trying to show. And it also, um, in this case, highlights the emotional impact of something that happened. Okay. Any questions about editing? All right, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about technical stuff, but I'm trying to not be too in-depth here because that's boring. Um, but in general, whenever you're selecting a camera, obviously there are a lot of different choices out there. As a general rule, of course, the more expensive a camera is, probably the better um, video quality you're going to get. Um, but I would say the two most important specifications or specs to look at are the resolution of the video and the frame rate. So here's just a quick little um, guide to different uh, video resolutions, if you're not very familiar with it. Oh, this is wrong. That should be, this should be 1080p is higher quality than 1080i. I. So standard definition, this is any, this is any sort of video uh, made from like in the early 2000s will be this size. And then you have like HD is about this big. And then you go all the way up to 4K, which is becoming much more popular, is way bigger. So as a general rule, um, the higher the video, the higher the resolution, the better the video quality and the sharper the image will be. But it will take up a lot more um, file size. So, and depending on what kind of camera you have, you may not be able to shoot in 4K. Now the GoPros we have that you guys can test out, they can shoot in 4K. And just to give you an example of how resolution can make a difference, I have this quick video that goes up to 4K. I don't like that. There's a part with animals that I want. Here we go. Oh, I can't see it. <laughs> That's a problem. So first we're just going to start out in standard definition, which is 480. And then we go up to, well now it's showing up. Let's go up to HD. Which is even better, of course. Now, 
Now, if you can't tell a difference, um, <laughs> that's actually very indicative of maybe you don't necessarily need to shoot at 4K. Um, because to a certain extent, like this projector, I'm pretty sure does not project at 4K. So you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference between um, 1080p and 4K on this sort of display. Now, 4K displays are becoming more and more common, but they're not very ubiquitous yet. So that's just something to keep in mind whenever you're shooting video, or you're having your students shoot video, is that is it really worth it to shoot in 4K? Maybe, maybe not. It's a good thing to experiment with. Go ahead. Um, I just looked up online. Um, if you have like an iPhone 7 or higher, it's already 1080. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not low, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say, I would say don't shoot in standard definition unless you're like really desperate. Yeah. Um, but I, th I would say 720 or 1080 are good enough. Yeah. Um, one advantage though if you shoot in 4K is that if you wanted to zoom into a shot and just use only part of it, so let's say that I only want this part of the line or something, um, you can do that without losing any pixel resolution. Um, but again, like I said, if your display does not go up to 4K and it only goes up to 1080, then there's no real reason to shoot higher except the, the video quality, if you downgrade it, might be a little bit better than if you just shoot straight at 1080. Um, but generally, I would just stick with 4K. Sorry, I would just stick with 1080 or 720. For another thing, the file sizes will be smaller. Any questions about video resolution? Okay, real quick, I'm going to talk about frame rate. Um, I don't want to get too in depth though, because it's probably not all that interesting. <laughs> but um, as you may or may not know, all that video is is just a series of still images just played really quickly. Um, and one individual image is called a frame. And um, the number of frames that are shown in a video in a second is of the frames per second, of course. So for decades now, movies have been displayed at 24 frames per second, so that every second there's 24 frames going by. Um, as a result, we've gotten very used to 24 frames per second being the standard um, frame rate for movies. 30 frames per second is more common on TV um, and is a little bit more realistic because things move at a, um, the speed that they usually move in real life. Um, <clears throat> however, it becomes less cinematic. And when I say cinematic, all that I mean is that's what we think movies look like. So the only reason that we think 24 frames per second looks like a movie is because that's how we see movies, is movies are 24 frames per second, therefore we think that's what movies should look like. And then what's becoming much more popular are 60 frames per second, um, which is used particularly in video games, and is much less cinematic, um, but it is, the, it is much more realistic looking. So here's some examples to see if you can tell the difference. Here's a little animation. Um, that one's really easy to tell the difference between frame rate. This one's at 120 frames per second. So notice how at the 15 frames per second, it looks all juddery, whereas the 30 and the, the 30 is a little less smooth than the 60, and even the 120 is even more smooth. So here's this guy. This guy I looked all over for comparison video. We were really. Oh, jeez. I don't need. Me I don't need sound for this. So this video up at the top is at 24 frames per second, which is the standard movie frame rate, and this one below is 60 frames per second. Let me know if you can tell a difference. Let me get some. There's some area. Yeah, here we go. There's some aerial shots. These are shot with GoPros, by the way. Can you tell much of a difference? You can definitely see a difference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's hard to tell which one's better. I mean, right? Yeah, that's the thing. And I, I was struggling for a while to find one that really showed the difference, and that it was tricky because oftentimes they look very similar. Um, personally, I prefer 60 frames per second. Um, well, I don't. I think in the 60, you can't even tell there's frames. It just all kind of goes together. Whereas right. on that 24, it's like almost like a clock to me. Yeah, yeah. I see what you mean. Um, 
But like I said, people sometimes prefer 24 frames per second for movies because that's what they're used to, how a mo what a movie looks like. Yeah. Personally, I'm not with that crowd, but <laughs> there are a lot of people. There are a lot of cinephiles that say that. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> so generally. Um, Obviously, once again, if you shoot at 60 frames per second, it will be um, it will take up more file size. But if that's if you want that different effect of a little bit more smoother movement, that's the thing to shoot at. It's really something that's good to experiment with, and the GoPro cameras that we have can shoot at 24 or 60 frames per second. So you can experiment with it when you guys go out and make your videos. All right. Any questions about frames per second? All right, now I'm just going to talk a little bit about different video editors. And it's cutting off on the side. So let's just do that. Oops. We don't want to go that far out. Sorry, guys. There. OK, so this, is, this first one is called OpenShot. It's free. It's for Windows and Mac. And um, there is no paid version, so all the features are right out of the box. Um, it's worth trying out. In fact, I have it installed on all these computers and on the laptops that you guys have, that some of you have been borrowing. Um, one tricky thing that I found with it when I was testing it out is that it, it displays video and audio the same, which is annoying. So that's annoying. Another one, and this is the one that I had you guys download beforehand, is Shotcut. Um, and again, this is a there is no paid version of this, and it contains all the features. Um, but there aren't as many features as, say, a paid video software. But the nice thing is, it, if it may be hard to see, but there is, you can tell what is audio in here and what is video. So that's an advantage that Shotcut has over OpenShot. One disadvantage, though, is I think it's a little bit harder to figure out how to do particular things, perhaps. Um, so that's one downside. It's still the one that I think is a little, just because you can tell the music and the video apart, that makes a big difference in how usable it is. So that's why I'm having us use that one. But you, you can feel free to use any of these when you make your videos. It's just the one that I'm going to show off is Shotcut. Um, this is a mobile video editor, and I think it's the most ubiquitous. It's called Kinemaster. Um, this one, there is a paid version. And the free version, there is a watermark on the video, which isn't all that lovely to have. Um, one advantage, perhaps, though, is that it, when Chromebooks can use Android, this will work on Chromebooks. It's worth mentioning those first two do not work on Chromebooks. Here's Wii Video. We, um, Katie talked about it in her presentation a little bit. This is another one that can use on Chromebooks because it's online. It's kind of like. Um, I lost the name. Soundtrap. It's, it's like Soundtrap in that sense because it's an online software as opposed to something you install. So as a result, you can use it on a Chromebook. There are some fairly significant downsides, though. For ex first of all, there's um, you can only do five minute ex five minute exports per month. Um, like you can only export up to five minutes in a month. Um, you can only have one gigabyte of video or audio assets to use in your video. And the max export resolution is 480 um, pixels. So it won't even be HD your final video. And I think the restrictions on the free version keep changing. So it's I guess it's worth keeping an eye on. But um, ultimately, I would say that Chromebooks are not the best thing to be editing videos on, unfortunately. We're trying to find a good system that will work, and we haven't really succeeded yet. This last one is called Media Composer First. Um, this is actually a free version of Avid Media Composer, which is very professional. In fact, it's actually um, the commercial version of this video is the dominant video editor software used in film and TV. So if you've seen a movie or a TV show made in the past, like, I don't know, decade, um, it was probably edited with this software. Um, and this is the free version. And What's really nice about the free version is it has most of the ver most of the features that the paid version has. There are some downsides though. For one thing, it can take a while to install. You have to have a free account. Um, it can be pretty tricky to figure out how to use. 
So that's one downside to using it in a classroom. But it, um, and you can only use four video tracks and eight audio tracks. It's probably not going to be an issue. You probably wouldn't need more than that. And because it's such an um, advanced system, um, not all computers can get it to work. It's something worth trying, though, if you want to download it. Um, and I actually have it installed on the laptops, but not these computers. Um, just because it's the most professional system, and you can do some really cool stuff with it. And then I have a few others listed here. Um, I, tr I tried these, but I couldn't really get them to work. You might have better luck, but I, it's worth checking out at least. So it's Lives and Keydown Live. And then these last two are the ones that just come with the computer. So you have iMovie, of course, with Mac. And then Windows 10, in one of the more recent updates, actually included a video editor. And I tried it out, and it's it works very differently than all other video editors. Um, it's actually a thing where you just like click and drag an image, but like it doesn't use the timeline system that I'll show you in a minute. So it's a little bit tricky to figure out how it actually works. But it's on all Windows 10 computers. And that's the end. <laughs>